Hi there, and welcome to this lesson on Pure Mathematics 4. In this lesson, we're on Chapter 3, 3.1, and we're looking at an introduction to parametric equations. Now, what are parametric equations? Well, instead of writing a function in terms of two variables, which is what we normally do, x and y, where y is a function of x, it is possible to introduce a third variable, t, and write both x and y as functions of t. So you'll get something like x equals a function of t, g of t, and y is a function of t, h of t. For example, if we had the equation y equals x squared, it's possible to write that in parametric form, where you get the two parametric equations, x equals t and y equals t squared. Why the letter t? Well, the letter t is used because the par parameter t frequently represents time. Neither x nor y is the independent variable. Uh, one doesn't depend on the other. Rather, x depends on time, and y also depends on time. So yes, it is possible to write y as a function of x, but both variables actually depend on time. And the other reason for writing a function parametrically is that it can provide a simpler way of describing certain curves that are very complex in Cartesian form. One thing we have to be able to do is to convert from parametric form to Cartesian form. And the method for doing this is usually to try and find t. Find t in terms of x or find t in terms of y from one of the equations. And then substitute the expression you get into the other equation. Now let's have a look at what that means. So example one. A curve has parametric equations, x equals t plus 3, and y equals t squared plus 2t, where t is a real number. Find the Cartesian equation of this curve in the form y equals f of x. The method is, we'll go to the first equation, and we'll get t on its own. So we've got t equals some function of x. Once we found out what t is, we can substitute that into the other equation, and then we'll have y as a function of x. Okay, I'll let you have a go at seeing if you can make sense of that. So pause the video, have a go at doing the question, and then come back to me again when you're ready. Okay, let's have a look. So we start with x equals t plus 3, the first equation, and we get t on its own. We write t in terms of x. That's easy to do. The 3 moves to the other side, and we get t equals x minus 3. Once we know what t is we can substitute that into the other equation. So substituting into y equals t squared plus 2t will give us y equals x minus 3 squared plus 2 into x minus 3. That is the answer, but frequently with these things you can tidy up the answer a bit. So we'll multiply out the brackets, which gives us that, collect together the terms, which shows us we've got the quadratic y equals x squared minus 4x plus 3. Now, for the parametric equations, if you've got x is a function of t, g of t, and y equals h of t, where there is the Cartesian equation that relates them together, like we found in the last question, two important statements that you do need to learn. They're connected to the domain and range of functions. Now, people often get confused on domain and range. The domain of a function is the values that x is allowed to take. Now, the domain of the function f of x is the same as the range of the first parametric equation, the parametric equation for x, g of t. The range of the function, f of x, and the range of a function is the values that y is allowed to take. Well, the range of f of x is the same as the range of the second function, the range of h of t, the second parametric equation. Okay, let's have a look at an example using this. So example two, given the curve with parametric equations, x is a half t and y is t squared plus 2t, where t is between minus 4 and plus 4. Part one is the same as we did in the last question. Find the Cartesian equation of the curve. So we'll go to x equals a half t. We'll get t on its own, t equals some function of x. We'll substitute that into the parametric equation for y. That'll give us the Cartesian equation of the curve. Uh, part two is the confusing bit. It's the tricky bit in this question. State the domain and range of f of x. So you're going to have to work your way through this, what it all means. The domain of f of x is the same as the range of g of t. The range of f of x is the same as the range of h of t. Have a go at working through that. And then the final thing is to sketch the curve. 
Once you know the Cartesian equation of the curve, it's not too hard to sketch it. Um, but do be careful on these sort of boundary conditions here, what they mean, that t has to be between minus 4 and plus 4. I'll let you have a go at doing all of that. So pause the video, try and work your way through the question, and then come back to me when you're ready. Okay, let's have a look. So part one is the same as we did in the first question. We go to x equals a half t and rearrange that to get t on its own. That's easy to do. Double both sides of the equation will give us t equals 2x. And then we substitute the value of t into the other equation. So substituting into y equals t squared will give us y equals 2x squared, which is y equals 4x squared. Part two is um, the tricky bit of the question. State the domain and range of f of x. So first of all, looking at the domain of f of x. Well, we're told in the question that the domain of g of t is that t has to be between minus 4 and plus 4. We want the domain of f of x. The domain of f of x is the same as the range of g of t. The domain of g of t is that t has to be between minus 4 and plus 4. We want to find the values that the function can take, um, or it would normally be the y values. So what's the smallest value the function can take? What's the biggest value the function can take? Well, g of t is this. It's x equals a half t. That's just a straight line. The smallest value it will be is when t is minus 4. The biggest value it can be is when t equals plus 4. So we just need to find a half of minus 4, a half of plus 4, and that'll tell us what the function values can be. So using x equals a half t, the range of g of t is minus 2 up to plus 2. And all we've done here is put minus 4 and plus 4 into this function to work out the smallest and biggest values that x can take. Therefore, the domain of f of x is the same thing. The domain of f of x is the same as the range of g of t. So the domain of the function f of x is x has to be between minus 2 and plus 2. Now we do the same thing for the range of f of x. Well, the range of f of x is the range of the second function. It's the range of h of t, which is the parametric equation for y. Well, we're told in the question that the domain of h of t Again, it's the t has to be between minus 4 and plus 4. But h of t is a slightly more complicated function. It's y equals t squared, or h of t equals t squared. Well, using y equals t squared, what's the range of that going to be? So between minus 4 and plus 4, what's the biggest t squared can be? What's the smallest t squared can be? Well, the biggest is it either minus 4 or plus 4. Minus 4 squared is 16, plus 4 squared is 16. That is the biggest it can be. So that's the upper limit we've got here. Now, what's the smallest t squared can be? The smallest will be when t is 0. And if t is 0, then t squared is also 0. So that gives us the lower limit here. So the range of g of t is that y has to be between 0 and 16. And then the last thing is easy. We just say that the range of f of x is the same thing. So y has to be between 0 and 16. And then finally, part three, sketch the curve. Well, to sketch the curve, we really want to know what it looks like in Cartesian form. Well, we've done that. In Cartesian form, the curve is y equals 4x squared. We know what y equals 4x squared looks like. And we just worked out in the last question what the domain and range of the function are. So we're not doing y equals 4x squared for any value of x. We've got the domain x has to be between minus 2 and plus 2. And also, when we draw it, we should notice that y goes between 0 and 16. But that's the range of the function. So sketching it, it'll look something like that. And the domain is minus 2 to plus 2. So we've started at minus 2 for x. We've finished at plus 2 for x. And if you look at the range, you will notice that it goes from y equals 0 up to y equals 16. OK, example 3. And we're leaving domains and ranges, you'll be glad to know. We're just going back to the business of how you convert a parametric equation into a Cartesian equation. The first two questions, it was quite easy to get t on its own. We've got two more examples um, where it's a little bit more tricky to get t on its own. So this first one here, the parametric equations are x equals 2 minus 3t over 1 plus t and y equals 5 minus t 
over 4t plus 1. Looking at the parametric equation for x, we need to rearrange that so that we've got t on its own, and t equals some function of x. It's a bit more fiddly to do that. Um, I'll let you have a go. So have a go at this, pause the video, and come back to me when you're ready. Okay, let's have a look. So same method as before, we start off with the parametric equation for x. We want to get t on its own. First thing I'll do is just uh, move 1 plus t to the other side and multiply by it. And that'll give me x times by 1 plus t is equal to 2 minus 3t. Multiplying other brackets will give me that. And then what I'll do is collect all the terms that have a t in on the left-hand side. All the other terms without a t in, I'll move to the right-hand side. And that'll give me xt plus 3t on the left is equal to 2 minus x on the right-hand side. And the reason for doing that is I can now factorize the left-hand side. Getting t into x plus 3 is equal to 2 minus x. And then finally, I can divide by x plus 3. And that'll give me t is equal to 2 minus x divided by x plus 3. So I've got t as a function of x. Once I've got t as a function of x, I can substitute that expression for t into the other equation. So I'm going to substitute into y equals 5 minus t over 4t plus 1. Substituting in t equals this fraction gives me that. That is the answer. But as before, um, if you can tidy up the answer, it's always a good idea to do so. It's just that tidying up this uh, takes a little bit of time and effort. So that's what we've got. To tidy it up, we really need to convert the 5 into a fraction, the 1 into a fraction, add those fractions together. So converting the 5 into a fraction, that's the same thing as 5x plus 15 over x plus 3, so that I've now got a common denominator on the top of x plus 3. And doing something very similar on the bottom, 1 is equal to x plus 3 over x plus 3, and then on the bottom I've also got a common denominator of x plus 3. And I've multiplied by the 4 as well to get 8 minus 4x on the top of that fraction. Okay, that's the tricky bit of the fraction work. Then you simplify that by doing 5x minus the minus x, 15 minus 2 on the top, 8 plus 3 on the bottom, and minus 4x plus x on the bottom. That gives me 6x plus 13 over x plus 3 for the denominator, uh, for the numerator rather, and 11 minus 3x over x plus 3 for the denominator. Finally, we've got a fraction divided by a fraction. If that's the case, then you multiply the two fractions together where the bottom fraction is turned upside down. We get the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. That gives us that. The x plus 3 is here. They can cancel with each other. And so the answer simplifies to y equals 6x plus 13 over 11 minus 3x. And you should really write in this condition where x can't equal 11 over 3 because that would make the bottom 0 and you can't divide by 0. Okay, last question. Same idea. By finding t in terms of x, write the following equation in Cartesian form. So we've got two parametric equations. x is the log of t minus 5 and y equals 1 over t plus 3. The way I'm going to do it is do the same as we've been doing. I'm going to work with the x. So I want to get t on its own from this equation with x. The way we do that is we do e to the power of both sides. So we'll do e to the power of x on the left-hand side and e to the power of log t minus 5 on the right-hand side. The e's and the log will cancel with each other because they're inverse functions, and then it's easy to move on. Okay, I'll let you have a go at doing that. So pause the video, have a go, and come back to me when you're ready. So x equals log t minus 5 is the starting point. And what I said was, do e to the power of both sides. And we're doing that because of the log here. It's often a fruitful approach. So on the left-hand side, we'll get e to the power of x. On the right-hand side, we'll get e to the power of log t minus 5. e and log are inverse functions, so they'll just disappear. They'll cancel each other out. And I'll just have e to the x is equal to t minus 5. And then it's just one easy step to get t on its own. That means that t is equal to e to the x plus 5. Once I know what t is equal to, I can substitute that expression into the other equation. So 1 over t plus 3 will become 1 over e to the x plus 5 plus 3, which simplifies to 1 over e to the x plus 8. 
There is a final thing that we should do on this question. If you go back to the parametric equations, we're given the domain in terms of t, which is that t has to be bigger than 6. We should really write the domain of this function in terms of x. And the way we'll do that is by using the parameter for x, x equals log t minus 5. So t has to be bigger than 6. I'm going to substitute 6 into this equation to find out what x equals when t equals 6. So when t equals 6, x will equal log t minus 5, which is log 6 minus 5, which is the log of 1, and the log of 1 is 0. So when t equals 6, x equals 0. So if the initial condition was that the domain was t has to be bigger than 6, that means the domain of the function, y in terms of x, will be x has to be bigger than 0. And that is the lesson finished. If you've got the textbook, then turn to page 19 and have a go at doing exercise 3A. Thank you very much for listening and cheerio.